Okay, so let's talk about this dice roller problem. So again, the steps of the game are important here. So in this situation, we have a dice. It is a six-sided dice. We know the sides are labeled one, two, three, four, five, six. We can look at the dice, we see the sides, one, two, three, four, five, six. And we have this three-step game. So first, you choose white hat. Uh, last class, there were some people who were confused about what is y hat allowed to be. So they said, I had to pick two because two is a side of the dice, but y hat does not have to be one, two, three, four, five, or six, right? Those are the things that are gonna come up, um, but y hat is your sort of best estimate in terms of minimizing something that's gonna happen later in step three. There is no reason that y hat actually has to be exactly one of these things. This is a little bit like the movies we talked about in the very first class, right? If you're estimating how much somebody likes a movie, even if they always answer four stars or five stars, your best guess might be four and a half stars, and that's possible. So that's one, one thing to clear up. Um, step two, we're gonna roll the dice once, call the outcome y, and step three, this is my favorite part, you pay me y minus y hat squared dollars. And the question is, what is the best number to pick? We did it last class for a four-sided dice. This class, we did it for a six-sided dice. 14 people said three and a half, three people said three, one person said four. If you pick three or four, you maybe were confused about what you're allowed to pick. Remember, you are allowed to pick things that are not exactly one of the dice rolls, and the perfectly correct answer is three and a half. And the reason three and a half is the right answer is because it is the mean of this dice. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's the mean of the dice. And that is what we showed last class. So on the sort of blackboard, last class, let's bring it up over here. Uh, we had this decomposition, and we used this nice trick. So we, we defined this loss function, which is how much you pay me on average when you choose black hat. And by doing a bunch of tricks, we got to proving that the loss function is a quadratic equation that has, in vertex form, is the mean of the random variable y minus y hat squared plus the variance of y. That is what we proved last class. And this kind of like this picture you should see in your head from uh, when you did quadratic equations in high school. So right there is, it looks like this. The x value here is the expected value of y. And then the minimum height here is the variance of y, right? So this, 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 uh, this is the vertex form of the quadratic equation. Uh, and that's what it looks like. And then you want to minimize how much you pay me. Of course, you should pick the expected value of y. And the amount you're going to pay me is the variance of y. That was all from last cl class. Uh, I think most everyone got three and a half this time, or three or four. Uh, ask me a question about this. Any questions or comments about what we did last class or getting back into it this class? OK, there was one thing in my proof that I skipped over last time, because we were low on time, and it's a little bit technical. It is, why am I allowed to split the uh, expected value into two parts. And so inside here we have one thing, y minus y hat squared, and I did this trick of adding and subtracting the expected value of y. And so I said, the thing we're looking at is the sum of two things, this thing a, this thing b, a plus b squared, and then I split that up into a squared plus b squared. So I replaced a plus b squared with a squared plus b squared. Um, and I called this thing the, the Pythagoras formula for random numbers. The expected value of a plus b squared equals the expected value of a squared plus the expected value of b squared. Um, of course, if you've done any math, you know that a plus b squared is not equal to a squared plus b squared. So there's something mysterious going on here. There's a missing term, which is plus 2ab. Yes, exactly. Plus 2ab, which I've written like this. So uh, if you really want to do a plus b squared, you need to add on 2ab. When does Pythagoras hold? Well, for triangles, Pythagoras holds when they're at 90 degrees to each other. And for random variables, it holds. So the terms and conditions, these are the terms and conditions that I promised last time. Uh, I'm going to say this equals 0. And then the terms and conditions are if the expected value of a times b equals 0. And when a times b equals 0, on average, this is called uncorrelated. Uncorrelated. So if your random variables are uncorrelated, um, if the product of them on average is zero, they're called uncorrelated. And when they are uncorrelated, this mixed term is zero, and you have the perfect Pythagoras formula. 
Um, and that is why I did this adding and subtracting. When you do the adding and subtracting, the two things become uncorrelated. Um, you could not use the Pythagoras formula uh, directly on these two because they're not uncorrelated. But on these two, they are uncorrelated, and it works. Let's check that they're uncorrelated. So let's do a little, a little terms and conditions check. Um, so this is like a lemma, a lemma, which is y minus expected value of y. Oh, that was called a. a equals this, uh, and uh, b equals uh, what is it? Y hat minus expected value of y are uncorrelated. Uh, maybe you want one of them to be the other way. Let's see. Okay, let's call. Let's b. Let's make b the other way. Expected value of y minus y. are uncorrelated. Okay, so that's my statement. I claim these two things are uncorrelated. Here's the proof. The proof, if you do the expected value of y minus expected value of y, that's a times b. So this is expected value of a, b. Just writing it out. You'll notice the only thing that was random here is y. Everything else is not random, right? This is some number. The expected value of a fly that's for a dice roll, that's 3.5. Y hat is whatever number you chose, not random. Um, so in this case, I can pull that out, right? Pulling out an, a constant out of the average. So just pulling, this is a number, you pull the number to the front, and now you have the expected value of Y minus its expected value, that is zero. So this is expected value of Y, minus y hat times zero, um, which equals zero. So y is the dice roll. On average, the dice roll is equal to the average of the dice roll. So the difference is zero. Okay. If you've done a good probability course, this is ho-hum boring. If you're rusty on probability, maybe it's a little confusing. What is, what is uh, random? What is not random? Please ask me. Sir, yeah. can you explain it once again? Yes. OK, let me explain it once again. So y is the dice roll y minus the expected value of y is the dice roll minus its mean. So that's like rolling a dice. What comes up on the dice? Minus three and a half. So if you roll four, y minus expected value of y is plus 0 0.5. And let's, let's do an example. Let's, let's write it out. So it's uh, plus 2.5 or plus 1.5 or plus 0 0.5 or minus 0 0.5 or minus 1.5 or minus 2.5, all with probability 1 sixth. So this is an example, right? So it's a random number, and I've taken whatever the dice roll was, and I've subtracted the mean. Okay. And now the claim is, on average, this thing is zero. On average, this thing is zero. So the expected value of y minus expected value of y, uh, we could write it out. Again, the expected value operation is a linear operation. You can pull constants out. You can do pluses and minuses. This is why they force you to take linear algebra class, so you get good playing with linear operations, you could write it like this. It's the expected value of y minus the expected value of the expected value of y. OK. Doing expected value twice, there's nothing random in there. That's, that's nothing. That's, that's just the expected value of y minus itself, which is 0. 3.5 minus 3.5 is 0. Um, this operation of taking a random variable and subtracting its mean is called centering the random variable. And when you center the random variable, the mean of the centered random variable is always zero. You could also check on this one in this example. They all average out to zero. All different ways of saying the same thing. All right, great question. Anybody else? OK, so we, we've centered it. By centering it, we made the mean zero. That was the whole trick I did before, by the way, was adding and subtracting the right thing to center the random variable y. I didn't call it that, but that's what I, I was doing. OK, so that was all. This is all sort of review. We filled in the terms and conditions now. And we know the answer to this question. Now we know when you're estimating this dice, you're playing this dice game where you pay the square loss. This is called, step three is called the square loss. The best thing to do is to do the true average of the dice. Whatever the dice are, on average, that is your best possible estimate for minimizing the square loss. All right.
We're going to move on this class is we're going to do harder and harder versions of this question. There's one more hard version and then there's a harder version still after that. But this is the simplest possible version. This is a great place. If something is unclear, you ask me now, we clear it up, we get it. We're ready to go for the next version. Anyone for questions about this game? Okay, let's do that. You guys are ready for the harder version. So here is the same exact game, but a harder version. And you'll notice this, there's no data in this game. Right? This is like a probability game. Could have done this game with probability 101. Yeah. So uh, actually what I want to ask was, can we take random, uh, can we take negative examples in probability? Negative samples in probability. Uh, what do you mean by negative? Like could the dice roll have some negative values here? Yes, sir. Yes, that would be fine. So you can imagine a dice where one side is labeled negative three, and then it, the, like, it could come up negative three, and then maybe y hat should be negative as well. So the moral of the story here is anytime you're estimating something that is random, your best possible estimate is the mean of the thing you're estimating. Um, in this case, the things were one, two, three, four, five, six. In general, maybe it's like negative 10 half the time, negative five half the time, and then your best estimate is negative 7.5, the mean of whatever it is. Is that what you mean? Okay, yeah, great question, yeah. So it's not limited to just one, two, three, four, five, six. Could be any, anything, anytime you have a machine that outputs random numbers, and you try to estimate what it is, your best estimate is whatever it does on average. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, good. This is a good, this is actually the perfect thing to clarify because in the next question, we're adding in some data. So before there was no data, it was pure probability. And the thing that made it pure probability, let me, let me pause this so nobody tries to answer while I'm talking. Okay. Um, the thing that made it pure probability is that you knew the sides of the dice. So I told you that the sides of the dice are one, two, three, four, five, six. But in real life, in a real data science problem, you do not know what the sides of the dice are. What do you know? You know data. You have seen somebody roll the dice many times, and that is your data set. Um, so we don't know the inside of the machine that generates the data. We only know samples from the data. And so this version of the game is exactly the same game as before, except for we don't know what is inside the machine. We only have access to the data. So let me tell you the exact rules. And what I want you to do is pretend there's a dice where you don't know what's on the sides of the dice. Right? You're not allowed to look at the dice directly. The only thing you can see is when you roll the dice, what comes up. Okay? And I said four sides, but it could have any number of sides. The number of sides doesn't matter. Okay, so here's the game. Step zero. Uh, remember, step zero didn't exist in the previous game because there was no data. Right? This is like a new step. So fix a specific number and data. This is the number of data points you're going to have available to you. And then we're going to roll the dice n data times. So maybe n data is 100. We roll the dice 100 times, and we call the outcomes y1, y2, all the way up to y100. Okay? So it's like you roll the dice 100 times. You're allowed to look at the 100 outcomes of the dice roll, but you are not allowed to look at the sides of the dice. So you don't actually know. Maybe there's like a side that's missing that never came up, right? There's a side of the dice that never came up in your 100-sided data set. Maybe you got really unlucky, and these are all equal to 5, because like you just got unlucky. Could happen. That's tough luck. And that's your life, OK? So um, you, you only have access to seeing the 100 dice rolls. You're not allowed to peek at the dice. OK. Step one is exactly the same as step one before. You have to come up with y hat. I called it y hat and data because it really depends on all these things. In the previous game, it didn't depend on anything. It just depended on your knowledge of the dice. But now you have this data set that's all you're allowed to use. And uh, I did add a little assumption here. No cheating by assuming anything about the dice. So, you know, if you did this game in real life, you could maybe assume that the dice only has, like, at most six sides or something. But, like, I really want you to pretend you don't know anything about the dice except for it came out with those numbers. All right. So that's step one. Same as the step one from before. You come up with y hat. Step two, this is the same as before. We're going to roll the dice one more time, and then you pay me in step three. Right? In, pay, in step three, you pay me the difference between the dice that came out in step two and what happened in uh, uh, your choice in step one. So the difference between the dice roll you haven't seen yet and y hat squared. So just like before, you can think of this, it's like I'm trying to use this data set to come up with the best possible estimate for this unknown value in y. The only difference is now I have this data set before I knew the sides of the dice. OK. Here's what I want you to do. Step one, find a strategy to compute y hat. So what are you going to do in step one? How are you going to find out y hat? Um, then what I want you to do is tell me 
which of these graphs looks like how much you pay me in step three versus end data. So this whole thing depends on end data. If end data is small, it's going to look like one thing. If end data is big, it's going to look like another thing. And I want you to think of the graph. So figure out what you think y hat should be, then figure out the graph of the loss, how much you pay me, versus end data. And here are some options. So on the y-axis is the square loss, so that's how much you pay me. Maybe it should say average square loss. And on the x-axis is the number of dice you roll. If you roll more dice or if you roll less dice, the situation is slightly different in a specific way. Do some math, figure it out, figure out what y hat has to be, and then think of which graph you want to do. And the options are like, do you want green, blue, purple, or red? Those are the choices. Any questions or comments about the question before I set you free? Is the, is the question clear? OK, let me give you a few minutes. Feel free to chat with people. Uh, this is a, maybe a tricky one. How are you going to compute y hat, and what does the loss look like? All right, I go, go think. Uh, I will open it. I'm pressing the play button. So it is open, and I'll give you guys like four minutes, say, to think about this. Okay, there's like 30 seconds left. I know a lot of people haven't answered yet, but put in your best guess, and then I'll probably give you a second round 
after, but I want to see where people are on making guesses. Maybe we'll have some discussion, and then I will send it back to you to try again. Put in your best guess, even if you're not sure. The, the thing you just said is the strategy. <laughs> yeah. So you, you figured out that part. Yeah, okay. This is, <laughs> let's take it out. Okay, let's see what you guys said. Okay, so which of these curves uh, are you going to do? What do people say? Okay, so uh, 11 people are in green, 4 people are in red, and 3 people are, are in blue. Um, okay, so those are the options. Uh, let's talk about the first part of the question here. Find a strategy to compute y hat. Uh, someone in the front row just said, why do we need a strategy? It's this obvious thing. Uh, the, and then the obvious thing he said is a strategy. <laughs> okay, so uh, does someone want to share what they think y hat should be? Like, how are you doing it? So you have this data set. You got to come up with y hat in step one. What is the strategy? What do, how are you going to compute y hat in step one? What do you do? So you take this data and you do something to it. What do you do? Anyone want to share? Not the person in the front row. We're going to make somebody else. I already know what you're going to say. Right? You're, okay, you work at Netflix, and the Netflix CEO says, here's our data set. Please come up with white hats so we can do it. What do you do? Yeah. Over, okay, yeah, okay, so I like this. You, so you want me to write them out. Let's, let's get some paper. Okay, this is exactly what you get. So you have y1, y2, y3, dot, 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 y, and data. Let's, like you can imagine n data equals 100. We have our 100 data points. Uh, and we write them out. Okay, and then you want me to divide by something? Divided by yn. Divided by yn. What is yn? Is n, n data? What is what is n over here? That's my question. Uh, so the total number of copies. Oh, the number of copies. So the number of things on the list. No, so the number of times you roll the dice. Ah, okay. The number of times I roll the dice is n data. So you want me to divide by n data? Okay, that 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 makes sense. That's a thing. N data, right? So if it was hundred, I I divide by hundred. Okay. Second of all. You said y1, y2, y3. That's like a list of numbers. What do, what do I do to the list? So you would, um, sum, it up. sum it up. Okay, good. Okay, great. This is great. Now you have an actual strategy. Uh, this strategy is called the mean, right? The, this is the mean, the mean of the list y1 to yn data. So you take the data set we have, compute the mean. Uh, some people might call this the empirical mean. Uh, let's add that word to the top. Empirical. Why is it called empirical? The word empirical just means having to do with the experiment we did. So this is like from our data set, this is the mean we saw. That is very slightly different than the true mean that we did in the previous problem, right? When you can look at the dice, you can calculate the exact true mean. But if you only have data, you can calculate this empirical mean. Some people just call it the mean, just don't get them mixed up. That's all I'm saying. This is exactly the right answer. So you were kind of unsure, but this is 100% correct. This is the right, best possible thing to do. And that was kind of the moral of the story of the previous level zero version of the problem was if you want to estimate an unknown number, your best possible estimate is the mean. If you have some data, what's your best possible way to use the data to get the mean? Just take the average of the numbers you have. Um, this is also what was said in the front row. Uh, Let's, let's say it this way. Who thought of using this for y hat? Put your hand up if you were thinking this. There are other possible ideas. Does anyone have a different idea for how to compute y hat? Yeah. So like we, uh, we can roll independent copies and uh -huh. which number is uh, maximum time and we can... Yeah, which one comes up the most times? Most time. Great question. Okay, this is great. This is fantastic. Let's write this one out. This is called the mode. The mode of y1 to yn. Uh, and this is whichever comes up the most. 
which value, which value comes up most. Okay. Um, the mode is a thing you can do. In our particular problem, let me tell you why the mode is not quite what we want. If your goal was, I want to be exactly 100% right as often as I can be, like maximizing the accuracy, then the mode is what you would want. You want to you be right as frequently as possible. But in our problem, we don't want to be right as frequently as possible. We want to minimize the square loss. And so the problem with the mode is, imagine there is a 51% chance of coming up 10, but then there's like a 49% chance of coming up zero. The mode is 10, but if you guess 10, when it comes up zero, you pay $100. So you pay big bucks when, you, when you're wrong, um, and that was going to cost you. It's better in that situation to do something like 5.1 or something, right? Like guess somewhere in between, so you only ever pay $25 most of the time, and you avoid paying $100. And so that is the reason that the mode is not the right answer. The mode is too weighted by the extreme kind of things. You want to make sure you're sort of always close. Otherwise, the square is going to kill you. Um, and it, yeah, it, it is also true that if, if, uh, if it said, you pay me $100 if you get it wrong, and you pay me $0 if you get it right, then the mode would be the right thing. But because it's this square loss, the mode is the wrong thing. So absolutely good idea with the mode, um, but it's not what we want. OK, so uh, yes, OK, uh, this is. Uh, does not minimize minimize the square loss. It does minimize the accuracy loss. Uh, and we're in this problem, we're doing the square loss. So that's why the mode is not what we want. But great suggestion. I'm glad that's on the board. Did anybody have any other ideas other than the mode or the median? median? The median? OK, yeah. The median. The median, OK, I, I won't write down what the median means. Um, <laughs> let's write the median, OK? The median, figure it out, OK. Um, again, the median, uh, the median would be something like if you want it to be an overestimate the same amount of time it's an underestimate and make that like as balanced as possible, then that's the median. But again, we're doing the square loss. We don't want the median. We want the mean because the mean minimizes the square loss. And we saw why the mean minimizes the square loss in our level one version of the problem. Yes. So, so very good. This is, this is a fantastic discussion. Uh, so again, this is like something that answers. It's the correct answer to a different question. The mode and the median, they answer different questions. For the square loss, we're talking the mean. Great discussion. Any, anyone else? Questions or comments or other ideas about what to do? OK, so now we know we're talking about the mean. Let's look at the different graphs that were chosen. So 11 people chose the green one. That's slightly over half the people. And then everybody else is split between red and blue. The green graph goes down, 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 down. And then it goes up, 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 up. I will tell you for sure in this problem, the green graph is wrong. If you chose green, it's the wrong answer. It is not green. It is one of the other options. I will not say what option it is or if, if these people are on track. The green is wrong. If you chose green, pick a different one, and try to think of like what happens here. Like Really think about the problem and think about what's going on. Um, I'm going to send it for a revote. You guys will revote, and we will chat about it again. OK, take a few more minutes. Definitely talk to the people next to you this time.
choose, you have one minute left. change your answer, you must uh, re-vote. Okay, here we go. Let's see what people said. So, I told you green was wrong. Uh, what did people say? People switch to? Okay. Red or blue? Okay, one person is in purple. Uh, okay, purple happens in other types of problems and things. So that purple is called like a threshold phenomenon where there's like this critical value and then you cross it. Uh, you guys figured it out that it, in this case, it is not the purple one. So purple is like other problems, not this one. Um, we're pretty split here. 11 people are in red and seven people are in blue. And the main, the only difference between red and blue is, is the error, is it going down to zero? That's the blue one, right? So more dice, you roll a, a million dice, you're getting like really close to zero error. Or is it kind of going down, down, down forever, but it never gets down to zero, it kind of approaches non-zero amount. In this, in this graph, it's like a little bit more than one, but you know, whatever it is. Uh, oh, in fact, I think it's one and a quarter. One and a quarter. Um, what is the right answer? The right answer is, it's the red one, the red one. So it does, it is true, it goes down and it doesn't reach zero. And actually, last class, I made a big deal. I jumped up and down and I said, this is the important thing everybody always forgets about in data science, this amount between zero and the smallest amount you could possibly reach, it has a special two-word name. The irreducible error. Yeah, this is the irreducible error from last class. And you can never get below the irreducible error. And in fact, we already did the irreducible error. When we did the first version of this problem, 
where we knew the sides of the dice exactly. That was kind of like rolling infinitely many dice. Like you've rolled the dice so many times, you're 100% sure that there's one six chance of being a one, a one six chance of being a two. That's kind of the infinite dice situation. So the, the very first problem we did was like the number of dice rolled equals infinity, perfect knowledge of the universe, right? I've, I have so much data, I know everything perfectly. And even in that situation, you saw that uh, the answer was not zero, right? You cannot reduce it down to zero. The answer was that the best possible thing is the mean and the amount you pay is this variance. And the variance of y in this problem is the irreducible error. Let's write this down. So, um, so this is like, let's, let's write down the morals of the story. So the, the version zero of the problem, the level zero version of the problem, level zero dice estimates. Oh, I see what's going on, okay. Dice, level zero dice. Um, so this is with perfect knowledge, perfect knowledge of dice. Uh, how should I say the perfect knowledge of the dice? Of dice, let's say the dice sides, right? Uh, minimize, minimize y minus y hat. Right, that was the level zero version. And we found that the best answer, best answer was y hat equals the true mean, right? And we can write down the true mean because we have perfect knowledge in the level zero. This is the one we did last class and the beginning today. And the minimum payment, minimum payment is, uh, let's say, the loss when at y hat, when y hat equals the expected value of y. So at the minimum, the loss you pay is the variance of y. And this is irreducible error. Even if you have perfect knowledge of the dice, you have to pay out this minimum amount. You cannot even, you know, even the Perfect knowledge will not save you from paying me on average when we play this game because the dice is random, right? You cannot predict it perfectly. Even if you know the dice perfectly, you will not predict what will happen perfectly and you will pay me this amount. Uh, for a four-sided dice, this was uh, 1.25, e.g. That was what we did last class. For a four-sided dice, uh, expected value of y equals 2.5, and the variance of y equals 1.25. So the best possible thing is 2.5, that's your best guess, and you gotta pay me at least $1.25 every time, even if you're doing the best possible guess, on average I'm taking $1.25 from you every time we play. Sometimes I take less, sometimes I take more, but on average, this is how much I pay. That was the level zero. Now in the level one version, that was the one we just did on on, um, well, in this one, the, the, the big difference is we don't know the dice, we have a data set. Have a data set, a data set of n data rolls. Okay, and we take our rolls, and the best answer is again the mean. This time, it's the empirical mean. So y hat equals, I'll say y1 plus dot 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 plus y n data divided by n data. And this is, this is called the empirical mean, the mean of the data. Empirical, empirical mean. Uh, some people might even write this as expected value with a hat of y. So not the true thing. If you don't like this, don't, don't write it down. But the hat means coming from the data. Uh, so this is like our estimate for what the true thing is. Of course, we don't know the true thing. We're using our data set to estimate it. This is not going to be perfect, right? Even if the dice is an honest four-sided dice and the true average is 2.5, when you roll some real dice, you're going to get a number that's not exactly 2.5, right? But that's our best guess given the data. And the best payout, uh, or the minimum payout, minimum payout, this is on average. Uh, this is what follows that red graph. And I will give you the exact formula right now. The minimum payout, which is the uh, minimum of the loss, the loss of y hat, when y hat equals empirical average. I'll just write emp mean over here. So when you do the best possible thing, you have the best possible strategy. What is your payout? It is uh, the variance of y 
That was, like before, the irreducible error. But there's a little bit more. And that little bit more is this much. It's 1 over n data times the variance of y again. OK, so this part really is like the irreducible error. Irreducible. That is like the stage 0 version of the problem, the irreducible, or the size of the irreducible error is this variance. So even if we had infinitely many dice rolls, we could now reduce this one down to 0. And this one over here, I call this one the error due to variance. Error due to variance. And you will notice the more dice you roll, the smaller this gets, right? This is it's 1 over the number of data points. If you double the number of data points, you reduce this error by half. If you had an infinite budget and you could collect more and more data samples for free, you could eventually make this one as small as you want. This, this part goes down to zero on its own. And that is why the graph looks like what it does over here. So the red graph is what it is. This amount is the irreducible error. And the difference between this thing and what the true red curve is, that is the reducible part of the error, the variance, and it's going down to zero as you go. Um, so that is the true thing. I will show you in, in 30 seconds here, or in a minute, why this is true. It's not hard to prove this formula. We're going to prove it in one second. It's going to use the Pythagoras formula for random variables one more time. Um, but that's the truth of what's going on. Uh, yeah? So, and can this have a bias dice? Yeah, there is no bias in this one. There is no bias in this one. You will see in a minute that we're going to have the level 2 dice problem. And that one will have bias. Why is there no bias in this one? There's no x values. Bias is something to do with the x values not behaving well. And there are no x values in this one. In this, in this one, it's the same dice every single time. And you just want to estimate that particular dice. So it's like there's only one x value. Which dice are you rolling? It's always the same dice. You'll see when we do the level 2, which is related to the video you guys saw, that there's x values. And once you have x values, then there's a third term, which is the bias. Um, another way to say it is that this, this strategy is perfectly unbiased. And that's why there's no bias term. And it's fine to be perfectly unbiased here because there's only one x value. Um, so uh, yeah. Yeah, the, this answer we came up with is perfectly unbiased. That's another way to say that there's no bias term. But yeah, there's no, no bias yet. Um, you're, you're looking forward to the next thing. All right. Other questions or comments about the statement so far? Yeah? Is it because of that one over uh, n over data that the graph is like decreasing? Over yes, exactly, exactly. So the, the, this graph, actually here, why don't we, this is a good way to, to do it. If you're ever unsure about a graph, you go to Desmos and we, let's plot it. So uh, let's make a, a value v, v could be 1.25, that's the variance. And then we're doing v plus 1 over n, but let's, n is x in Desmos, times v. So uh, there it is, and there's the graph. And the y equals v is the asymptote. Let's make that one a dotted line. So there's the graph, right? So it's the function v, 1.25 plus 1 over x times v. It looks like this. It's getting really, really close as x goes to infinity to the whatever the irreducible error is, which is the variance of y. Uh, yeah. This is, this is why we make you take calculus, so you can kind of understand graphs like this. OK, great question. Any, anyone, anyone else? All right. Let me, let me just say two important takeaways. Um, the most important takeaway is that more data is better, right? More data is better. Why is more data better? Because you can shrink this term. There's one term you'll never get rid of no matter what, even if you have perfect knowledge. But in practice, there's these other terms where more data helps. So more data really does help. The more data you have, the better it is. Um, you guys all selected the green term originally, right? When I did the problem the first time, everybody chose the green graph. And the green graph makes it seem like if you have 100 dice rolls, that's worse than 10 dice rolls. Okay. That's completely wrong. More dice rolls, always better. More data is. Everything else being equal, more data is always better than less data. Uh, you will see in a minute that there is something on the x-axis that is not the number of data points where it does do this. Uh, and that was from the video. So you're probably mixing up the thing from the video with the number of data points. But 
Number of data points, you always want that to be as big as possible. Uh, that always helps. Uh, okay, assuming you don't have to like pay money for it or something, right? Like uh, everything else being equal. So that's one important thing. Um, okay, I think, you know, uh, the second important thing I will tell you when we do the derivation. Uh, but that's the most important thing. So, so the moral, oh yeah, let's, let's write moral for both of these. Moral. Uh, more data is better. <laughs> more data is better. Okay, that's the moral of this one. The moral of level zero, zero that one had a moral too, which is the mean is the best. The mean is best. So not mode or median for this problem. And it's exactly because we're doing the square loss that the mean is best. That was the moral of the level zero problem. And the moral of the level one problem is that more data is better. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to do some little technical math to prove the formula. I'll do that in one second. But questions first? This is, your, this is your way to delay the technical math for as long as you can. You said that there are another ways, uh, another mean. Uh, are there any uh, other ways? Oh, other than the mean? Yeah. If the loss function is not the square loss, yeah. then there's different things other than the mean. But if the loss function is the square loss function, like was stated in the problem, then the mean is the best. And, and it's true, I haven't like shown you, right? So, but I've shown you that if you have the square loss, then the mean is the best. That is what we did sort of last class. Yeah, great, great point. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so here is the proof. The proof of the error formula. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to write, um, so y hat is equal to this, this average, y1 plus dot 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 plus y n data divided by n data. Okay, and I'm going to calculate what is going on for the loss, the loss of y hat. Okay, and we had a formula before we already simplified this. So you could write this thing down as the expected value of y minus y1 plus dot 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 plus y n data over n data squared. And then take the average. This is the average over y. So e sub y means take the average over the y. That's like really what it is. But last class, at the end of the class, we did this manipulation and we figured out that if you write this in vertex form, it is equal to the variance of y plus how far away things are from uh, the true mean. So it's y1 plus dot 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 plus y n data divided by n data minus the expected value of y squared. And this is what we did last class from last class. Uh, also the warm up problem of this class. Okay, so that's the first thing. By the manipulations we did, you repeat them one more time exactly the same way, and you see that you want this thing to be as close as possible to the mean. If it was exactly equal to the mean, you would have the best possible thing, but because you only have n data data points, you should not expect this to be exactly equal to the mean. This can be close, but not perfect. Um, that's the loss. This is all from before. Now the thing to notice is that this thing depends on the data, right? So if the data comes out and you're lucky, then maybe this is very small. If the data comes out and you're very unlucky, then this, maybe this is very big, okay? How big is this on average? So now I'm doing the average over the data set. So the average with respect to y1 to yn of the loss. Okay, so this is the point. Sometimes this is big, sometimes it's small. How big is it on average? Let's calculate. And I'm averaging over these y1 to yn's. Um, the variance of y, that's some number, like 1.25. When you take the average by linearity, that just pops out. So this is the variance of y. And then the thing to actually average is y1 to yn, and then the average of this square thing, plus y n data divided by n data minus the expected value of y squared. So how, how big is this thing on average? Okay. Uh, it's the expected value of something squared. The expected value of something squared. And the thing inside is a sum of a bunch of stuff. How would you simplify the expected value of something squared when the thing you're squaring is a sum of a bunch of stuff? You have to use the Pythagoras formula that we did before. So we're going to use Pythagoras one more time. We're going to write this 
as a sum of uncorrelated things, and then we will use Pythagoras. So here is the way to write it as a sum of uncorrelated things. So the first step is I'm going to take this 1 over n data that is inside the bracket with a square. I'm going to square it and pull it outside the bracket. Okay. So there's going to be a 1 over, and this is important, it's an n data squared when it got pulled out. So pull that right out, 1 over n data squared. Uh, when you do that, you should also, you know, like this term doesn't have a 1 over n data squared, so you should add it on. And I'm going to add it on. You'll see exactly how I want to write it in a second. And I'm going to write uh, y1 minus the expected value of y plus y2 minus the expected value of y plus dot, 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 plus all the way up to yn minus the expected value of y. OK. So that's, I claim these two things are equal. Um, you might notice there is only one expected value of y in this formula. But now there's n expected values of y, right? There's 1, 2, 3, all of that. That's exactly because you had to multiply by this n data on the bottom. So the number of copies of expected value y is exactly n data. That's exactly what we want to kind of factor it out. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that instead of writing it like minus, add them all up, then subtract a big number, I'm kind of subtracting as I go y1 minus the expected value, y2 minus the expected value. And now you'll notice all of these things are centered. Every individual thing is mean 0, exactly by the thing we said before. If you take a random dice roll and you subtract its mean, you get something new whose on average is 0. So we're adding up all these things, and they're all on average 0. OK, uh, and then it's all squared. OK, I forgot the squared. Let's put the squared back in. Back in. Everything, everything squared. Let's, uh, let's do it like this. We'll square it, and then we'll put brackets on the outside. Everything is square. OK, so we're adding up a bunch of these centered things. Not only are they centered, every individual term is independent. If you multiply one term by the other term, they're independent, and therefore, they are uncorrelated. So notice, notice the expected value of y1 minus the expected value of y times y2 minus the expected value of y. That equals 0. Um, because, well, it's actually 0 times 0. Um, because they are independent, independent, and mean 0. Uh, OK. So these terms are uncorrelated, 0 times 0. And therefore, by Pythagoras, I can split up this big sum. It's a sum of n individual things squared. That becomes, square them all up, then add them. So this is the variance of y plus 1 over n data. And now I have a sum of n things, n things, uh, the expected value of y1 minus its expected value squared plus y2 minus its expected value squared plus dot, 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 dot all the way up to n of them. Uh, and I forgot the squared. So this is by Pythagoras. OK, and last but not least, I'm adding up this number plus that number plus that number. But every individual number is actually exactly the same. And that's because the dice roll y1 and the dice roll y2 are the same dice roll. They have the same distribution. And this magical incantation, y minus its mean all squared, on average, is equal to the variance of y. So I have. Variance of y plus variance of y plus variance of y plus variance of y, adding it up n times. So this equals the variance of y, the irreducible error, plus 1 over the number of data points squared. And then I have the variance of y plus da 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 da, da plus the variance of y. All of these things are equal, and they're all equal to the variance of y. There's n of them. And so when you add up the same number n times, you get n times that number. OK. And that is the formula that we wanted. The variance of y plus 1 over the number of data points times the variance of y. OK. So that is the derivation of the formula and why it works. That's why that red curve comes out the way it does. Any questions or comments about this thing? There it is from start to finish. I will also say, 
this is typed up on the website. So if you're having, you know, you, you want to copy it all out and get it like nice and beautiful, you can go read the typed up version as well. I'm trying to give you the play-by-play -play so you can sort of understand the themes here. Um, but if you prefer the typed up version, you can go check that out as well. Questions? All right. So this is the second thing that I wanted to tell you is where did this term come from? Like we understand the irreducible error of variance y. That was the first term. We kind of understood where that came from. What is going on with this term? Why did it appear? And the reason it appears is because we are estimating the true mean. We want to estimate the expected value of y, but we're only using n data points. Okay? And we're not going to get it perfect. And what this is saying is the size of the error between our best estimate and the true thing is size 1 over n data. Right? Your estimate for the mean, uh, if you only have n data samples, you're going to be off by 1 over n data uh, in the squared sense. Your squared error will be 1 over n data. So as n data gets bigger and bigger, this goes to 0, but that is how close you are. Uh, this is really related to the central limit theorem. If you've seen the central limit theorem, you also know if you add up n things, what's going on. Same kind of idea. Um, so that's where this term comes from and why it is not 0. It's not 0 because this thing is not perfectly the expected value of y. It's typically a little bit far away from the expected value of y, and we just calculated how far it is. That's what the 1 over n is. Uh, OK. That is the variance, the story of the variance term. And this is called the variance term. Um, I mean, it is a variance. But it's sort of saying, your data is not perfect. It would be so nice if your data perfectly matched the true average of the dice. But it doesn't. It's somehow a little bit off. And how far off it is depends on the number of data points. This is called the variance term. OK. We're about to do the level 2 version of the dice roll problem. And there's going to be a, a whole other thing of complexity. So this is your chance. If you have any questions about the level 0 or the level 1, before it gets even harder to please ask. OK. The level 2 version is exactly what you guys saw in the video that was for today. So the level 2 version, level 2, level 2. And it and really, uh, really doesn't look like dice anymore. Now there's x's and y's. You can think of it's like we have many different dice. There's dice of flavor one, there's dice of flavor two, there's dice of flavor three, there's a dice of every flavor for every different x values. And instead of rolling the same dice over and over again, I pick a random flavor of dice and I roll that dice. Okay? And the question is, can you take this collection of dice rolls and turn it into uh, some information of the thing? So it's like, uh, um, so there's many, the new thing is there's many different x values. And we, now we do roll a dice of flavor x. Roll a dice of flavor x. Uh, and new x chosen for each sample. New x chosen for each sample. And the question is, again, can you determine what the mean of the dice is for a given x value? And we also, we cross our fingers and we hope that the dice where x equals 1.9 and the dice where x equals 2 are closely related. Um, so uh, we hope that uh, we have continuity. I'm going to say this, continuity in x. So the dice with close x values are close to each other. All right. This is exactly the setup that was in the video over that you guys saw. Let's uh, open up this thing. So this is the cannonball distance estimation problem. What does this thing say? So tell me it's two. OK, uh, ignore. I don't know. OK. OK, so this was what was done in the video. Uh, I do think it makes more sense to no longer think of them as dice, because dice don't really have this x property. But uh, the example I came up with for the video and the example that I like is you have a cannon, and you can point the cannon to any angle you want. Right? So the, the cannon can be pointed at 0 degrees, that's like perfectly horizontal, or it can be pointed at 90 degrees, that's perfectly vertical. And then you shoot the cannon to see how far the cannonball goes. And the problem is there's wind and other random things that affect the cannonball. But you want to determine what is the real relationship between the angle that you pointed at and how far it went. So the y-axis is the distance in meters, the x-axis is the angle in degrees, and you want to figure out, using these data points, this true blue curve, which is what it does on average. 
that was from the video. Um, you guys should have seen the video already. So I kind of gave a summary of the, of the problem. Any questions or comments about like what the setup is or clarifying what the rules are with the canon? So can the value be negative? Can the value be negative? Uh, no. <laughs> let's, let's say that. There's a data point. Oh, can the y value be negative? The distance, yes, that can be negative. The x cannot be negative. So I said the x is between 0 and 90. Um, the distance, what it is, it is in reality, it's the true value, which is the blue curve, plus some random wind. And if the wind is, is very far against you, then you, you can have a negative. So you shoot the cannon, it goes behind you because the wind blew it that way. Um, right, so you, you shoot it at zero degrees and then it goes behind you a little bit because of the wind. Okay, uh, it's not a real, I didn't actually build a cannon for this. This is made up, okay, <laughs> this, good. Yeah, that's a good point. It can be negative here. That doesn't change anything. Great question. Uh, anyone, anyone else? Okay, so, and in the video, the suggested answer we want to estimate the mean, so the answer was let's um, estimate a mean by having a little window. So if you want to know what is the value, let's say at 45 degrees, that's a good, a good way to do it. So suppose you want to know how far will the cannon go when you shoot it at 45 degrees. So you take 45 degrees, you make this little window, which is this purple area. And you look at all the data, data points that are within this window. In this case, there's one, two, three, four data points, right? One, two, three, four data points. And now we are back to the level one problem. We have rolled the dice four times, and we're going to average those four points, right? Four points, it's like the level one dice roll problem. You just think of these as four different dice rolls for the thing we're trying to get. Take their average, this one plus that one plus that one plus that one, divided by four, that is my estimate for the test point. So at 45 degrees, I think it's gonna go that far. And that is a distance. Okay, the only thing that is annoying about this strategy is that it depends on the window size. So if you make the window size bigger, you get more points. If you make it smaller, you get less points. What should I do? Should I make a really big window or a really small window? And this was the topic of the video. So what I'm going to do now is ask you what you think you should do. Uh, okay, here is the thing. In the nearby neighbor averaging, is it better to have a window size? The window size is called delta. So delta is the width of the window. I think it's how far in either direction. Is it better to have a window size delta that is very small, or is it better to be very big? Reminder, small windows contain very few data points, but big windows will contain many more data points. You tell me, what did you understand? Is delta small better or is delta big better? Okay, it's open. I'll give you one minute. Okay, and I'll, I'll, I'll do the picture one more time over here. So you want big window or small window? Okay, I'm, I'm not giving you much time here, so you have to kind of go with your gut instinct. There's only 10 seconds left. Put in your guess on what you think it is. If you saw the video and you internalized the video, you already know the answer, but uh, was, I guess I'm kind of seeing how much you understood from the video. Okay, time's up. Let's take a look. And I want to reveal uh, counts, reveal submission counts. What did people say? Okay. Seven people said smaller is better. Two people said bigger is better. And 10 people said secret third option. Uh, <coughs> this, I think, is the first really counterintuitive thing about data science is that secret third option is correct. So <laughs> very good. Smaller is not better. Bigger is not better. And to me, it's really counterintuitive that these are both wrong. Like, surely, it's got to be either smaller is better or bigger is better. Let me make the argument for smaller is better, and then I'll make the argument for bigger is better, and you'll see why it, the answer is secret third option. Okay. So first of all, 
let's do the argument for bigger is better. There is a very simple reason why bigger is better, and we already wrote it down on the blackboard. Who can tell me why is bigger better? Data is better. Yeah, well, it's better in what way? The data is better. I agree with that, but what, what is, yeah, you're doing this. More data is better. More data is better. Didn't I tell you that already? I wrote that on the board, didn't I? I said more data is better. More data, that was, that was the, the moral. More data is better. If you make the window bigger, you get more data, okay? So that is the argument for bigger. Uh, we should, we should uh, you know, maybe, uh, uh, by, let's say, all else equal, <laughs> because that is the thing that is missing. More data is better. I think I said that out loud. When I, well, I didn't write it down, but I said it out loud at least, okay? If everything else is equal, more data is better. So by making a big window, you get more data points. This More data points is better. Why is more data points better? Because it reduces the size of this term, right? This one over term, that is getting reduced. And that is like how, how, much, how much the, the estimate you're doing, how much is that jumping around? If you average 100 points, it's not gonna move very much. If you average only two points, just if you get unlucky, then you're gonna have a big jump. And so more data is better, it really will reduce this term. Of course, it's not true because all else is not equal, okay? So the problem in our level two problem, which is uh, really the cannonball problem, so e.g. the cannonball problem, cannonball problem, uh, everything else is not equal. So it is true we get more data points when we do a big window, but something is being sacrificed when we do a big window. So, uh, so uh, let's, let's say big window. Uh, big, that, that B came out funny. Let's try again. Big window. And the pro, the pro for the big window is more data points. More data points. But there is a con. So if everything else was equal and there was no con, then more data would always be better. But everything else is not equal. As you increase the window size, you are, it's true you are getting more data points, but there is a problem with those data points that is appearing. Uh, who can tell me from the picture, what is the problem with increasing the window to get more data points? What's the issue? In the corner, yeah. They're increasing the bias of your estimate. I'm increasing the bias. What, what does that mean? Why? That's very good, yeah. So this is the issue. So I made the window so large that the points that I'm pulling in, those data points that I was so excited to get, those data points are from these angles that are very far away from 45 degrees. And therefore, they are not exactly related to what I want to estimate. All right? I want to estimate how far the pin goes when you shoot it at 45 degrees. And I made the window so big that I'm, I'm including points over here that it's like 80 degrees. Does this point at 80 degrees tell me a lot about what the answer is at 45 degrees? No. Well, it tells me a little bit, but not a lot, right? It tells, the amount that it tells me is basically how slopey the true answer is. If the true answer was like a perfect flat line, then we would be back in the original situation we were in for rolling the same dice over and over again. If they're all actually the same, then yeah, it's helpful. But if they're very different, then they're very different. So the further you are away, the more different a 45 degree cannon shot and an 80 degree cannon shot is, the less you should want to include this point. Okay, and that is exactly the problem with a big window, is that it includes points that are far away and less relevant. It includes, includes, I'm gonna say far away points. And those far away points, points, uh, those are the problem. The far away points do not give us the right amount of information. So we are getting more data points, but we're getting more sort of low quality data points. So more data points is good, is always good if they're all the same quality, but you're sort of sacrificing the quality of your data points by taking further and further ones away. On the other hand, you know, the small window is exactly the opposite situation. So if you have the small window, then you will have very, very high quality points, right? All these points in the small window, they are all very close to 45 degrees, so they're all great quality. These things tell me a lot of information about what I'm trying to estimate, but the problem is there's only three of them. And when there's only three of them, we saw that you have an error term that goes like one over n, that, that is big, it's only one third. It could be one over 100. So I'm, I'm sacrificing there. Uh, okay, so, you know, 
let me, let me just say small window is the reverse. Small window is the reverse. Okay. All right. Um, so what is actually going to happen is just like before, we have this nice decomposition of the irreducible area, uh, the irreducible error, and this next term, which is like the variance. Turns out there is one more error term, which is telling you kind of like how these low quality points are affecting things, right? So if you include too much low quality data, you will actually ruin yourself on the third term, and that term is indeed it's called the bias. Um, I think you should, you should try to think of a way to explain this idea to yourself that does not use the word bias. Because the word bias, it like means something in real life that is not this. It's like kind of slippery to put your finger on what does the word bias mean. Um, so explain this thing to yourself in a way that doesn't involve the word bias. For me, in my brain, I'm talking about this like far away point. Right? It's like low quality data is like influencing my good data and is making it a worse estimate. And here is the decomposition. Let me make sure I get this right. I will, I'm, I'm copying it directly from uh, the website that has the, uh, the thing. Okay, here, here it is. Here, I'll, just, I'll show you guys the website so, so you can make sure you also go to the website. Here's the website, our website, that I wrote for the bias variance decomposition. There's three terms. The first term is the irreducible error. The second term is what we just did, the variance with respect to the data. And then there's this last term, which is like the bias term. Uh, so let me let me copy it down on the board. So the best or the loss, the loss of using f hat of x as an estimator. So f hat of x is the function that you get by fixing a particular window size. Let's let's draw the picture of f hat of x. That is the function estimate right here. So there, that purple line is f hat of x. And you can see it changes based on the window size. If the window size is very big, it's kind of flat. If the window size is too small, it kind of goes up and down all over and it's crazy. Um, but in general, you have the loss or the expected loss. It has the variance of epsilon. This is the irreducible bias. Same exact thing. I called it the variance of y last time. Uh, in those problems, the variance of y is the irreducible error. But in general, it's the error, uh, variance of epsilon. That's the irreducible error. You will never, even if you have perfect knowledge of everything, you will never be able to get rid of this. Um, plus, there was the variance um, with respect to the data of f hat of x. OK, and this is the one. This is the variance term. Uh, and in our previous problem, we did it. And it worked out to 1 over the number of data points times the variance of the dice roll in the level one dice. So this is the one. You should expect this one to shrink like one over the number of data points you're using at the point x. So this is the thing where, in this particular case, um, the size of that error term is sort of proportional to one over the number of points I typically have in the window. So right now I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's like one over eight coming from here. If I make the window bigger, that term absolutely goes down. And the bigger I make it, the smaller that term is. You know? If I, I can really shrink that term as, as small as I want by making it bigger and bigger, that particular term in the error will go down to zero if I have more and more data points. The thing that we want to do, though, is minimize the total sum. And there's this other term now, which is the bias term. And again, bias is a slippery word. So it is the bias term, but be careful with it. Uh, OK, got it. Bias, is that right? OK, hopefully it's OK. Um, and that is the expected value of f of x minus f hat of x all squared um, with respect to the data. Uh, is that? No, the expected value squared. Let me, let me copy it exactly so I don't mess it up. OK, here it is. Uh, the expected value with respect to the data minus f. OK, yeah, they're right. That's what I want. Let me, let me rewrite it. This is all wrong. Don't copy this down. <laughs> OK. The expected value of f hat minus f. And this is all squared. So uh, the thing inside the bracket is called the bias. And when you square it, the bias squared is what contributes to the loss. Um, 
And in this particular example, I can tell you exactly what the bias squared is. Uh, is this what we want? Hmm. Nope. 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 Uh, math and size. Is that what we want? Nope. We want Desmos. Here we go. OK. Uh, so in this particular problem, you can see the bias is exactly the difference between the blue curve and where the purple curve is on average. And you can see that in this middle, when I'm estimating at 45 degrees, when I have a big window, I'm biased negatively. The purple is always underneath the blue. And that's exactly the idea. These points over here that are far away from 45 degrees are contaminating my average. And they're contaminating them downwards in this case. And that's because these points are quite low, whereas 45 degrees is the, is the maximum. So the bias is exactly this difference, um, but not for one realization, but for on average what it is. And if you saw the video, you saw me kind of like resampling it and understanding how big that difference is. Uh, OK. That's where we're going to stop. Um, this is a good chance. If you were sort of confused by the video before, go rewatch the video again and try to figure it out. Uh, on Wednesday's class, we're going to also introduce doing this stuff in Python to sort of get an even better idea of, of what to do. OK, we're going to stop there. Uh, I'll be around for questions. If you have any questions, come on down. Uh, and otherwise, see you guys on Wednesday.